up, Rock Church? Say Jesus. Jesus. What's happening, Rock Church? How y'all doing today? Very good. We want to say hello to all our campuses, East County, North County, San Ysidro, uh, microsites, and soon to be City Heights. Let's give all our campuses out there a big hand. Amen. Appreciate you uh, praying for our City High campus. Whenever we get a campus, we have to get a use permit called a CUP, uh, conditional use permit. Takes over a year, and you have to uh, interact with the community. Sometimes the community doesn't want it. They want conditions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it took a long time to get this one, a lot of opposition. Uh, so we just got our use permit for our City Heights campus this week. Amen. Amen. I'm very excited. November 22nd, we'll be starting church out there. It's going, to be, it's going to be awesome. If any of you know that area, we will be in the Pearson Ford building right on El Cajon Boulevard and 15 Freeway. It's all glass, right? right uh, looking right out on El Cajon Boulevard. I think it's like 50,000 cars a day ride right in front of it. And you can look right in and see the gospel on the screen. It's going to be awesome. Amen. Amen. Uh, amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a big hand on that. Amen. 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 Uh, next week we are starting a series called All In. Let me encourage y'all to, um, for this whole series, not only to come every week, but to invite somebody. The number one way people come to church is through a personal invitation. Not a flyer, not a phone call, but a personal invitation to somebody they know. How many of y'all know someone who needs to hear the gospel? There you go. Invite them to church. Amen. Amen. All the campuses. And uh, we want to give the choir. We have the choir in all our campuses uh, today. Let's give all the, all the campuses, all the choirs a big hand. God bless y'all. Thank you very much. Got four choirs running. Let's get on our knees and pray. Let's get on our knees and pray. Hmm. How many of y'all here for the first time? Good, 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 good. Welcome. We hope God uh, just kind of nudges you a little bit, just a little bit like that. Lord, thank you so much. Lord, we pray you encourage us. And, Lord, I pray that you would challenge us, encourage us to trust you even when we don't like what's going on. In Jesus' name, amen. Give someone a high five, hug, kiss. Amen. If you are a visitor, what we do is we hold our Bibles up and say words. So on the count of three, you can take your Bible wherever you have it on your phone, tablet, or old school book form. And just hold it up and say word on three. One, two, three, say word. word. It's funny. It's all these lights. Now everyone's got an electronic phone. I mean electronic Bible. Back in the day, you would have just this old school. This is called, this is a book right here. <laughs> It's a book, it's a book. <laughs> Let's turn to, um, okay, the book is called Habakkuk, H-A-B-A. Just look for H-A-B-A, Habba, 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 Habba. It's in the Old Testament, Habakkuk. Old Testament, I'll give you a minute. I know it's going to be hard. It's not a book you normally read. It's a three chapters, a little tiny book in the Old Testament, Habakkuk. And if you are a regular here, y'all know what a regular is? Someone who comes regularly. You should have a Bible. If you are a regular, if you're a visitor, you didn't know any better, we'll give you a pass. But if you're a regular, you should have a Bible. Amen? Habakkuk chapter 1. Okay, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if the answer is yes. When we raise our hands, we like to put our elbow above our ear. Okay, not a T-Rex raise like that. <laughs> How many of y'all ever had a situation in your life where you were mad at God? Mm-hmm. So that's good exercise for your shoulder too. That's the reason you got to work out. Oh, by the way, another reason to work out so when you worship God, you can do this for more than a minute. Because <laughs> I see you saying, hallelujah, oh, man. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's why you got to exercise, okay. 
How many of you have had, had a situation in your life where, where something was happening and you thought God was not fair? Okay. You saw someone else getting blessed that you didn't think was worthy of the blessing they were getting. And you thought that you should be getting that blessing. Or that you thought that you, should, you deserve a blessing more than them. Why were they not being judged for their sin? Why were they not being judged for their behavior? And I, I'm, look at all the good I'm doing. And how come I'm not getting blessed? God, that is not fair. Okay. God, how come those... Evil people aren't being condemned, judged, caught. Why are they getting away with what they're doing? Why are they having success? That's not fair. Okay. Question. How many of you really know everything about yourself? Like everything. A couple people. <laughs> we need to talk because I want to know. I want to know how you all know how many, how, many, how many of you really know why you do what you do? You understand why you think what you think, how you can change. You know uh, everything about um, your actions, your, the motivation behind your actions. You know everything about your psychology. You know all about how you respond to things, why you respond to things. You know everything about how you can change and be better. And everything about yourself is known. It's pretty good. We need to talk after, sir. I want to know. That. It's so amazing how 99.9% .9 of you don't know everything about yourself, yet you can judge God and you can judge how other people should be treated based on what you don't know about them. Is that you can look at a situation and say, that person deserves this, that person doesn't deserve this. Why aren't you doing this? And then God, why aren't you doing that? And because I have all the information I need, I have come to the point where I can actually say with righteousness that God, you are wrong. That you're not being fair. I was watching a video yesterday, uh, not yesterday, uh, last week on YouTube. I believe it was on YouTube, on, on the internet somewhere. And it was about this, this gay activist that was talking against the Bible. And he was on a screen talking to high school kids. And he was cursing, cursing the Bible and God. Cursing. And high school kids were just walking out of the thing. But he was, and I said, this guy is cursing God. And not only did I agree, not agree what he was saying, obviously, but I felt bad for his soul. That he would curse God. And that we can actually look at a situation and say, God, you are wrong. You are not fair. Now, let me, let, me, let me say this. It is okay to say, God, I don't understand. It is also okay to say, God, I don't like this. It's okay, but you also got to know the big picture. Because at some point in your life, you're going to get to a point, and you've seen this in your circumstances, where you'll be mad at God, God's not fair, this is not happening right, blah, 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 blah. And, and at the time, you realize, oh, now I get more of the information. I see now why that happened. I want to challenge you today that you would fight and hold on to God even when you don't understand. Because God is not fair. Fair would be that you and I would pay for our own sin. That you would say, God, here's all my sin. You know, fair is that, not that Jesus shouldn't die for my sin. I'm going to pay for my sin. That's fair. You don't want God to be fair. <laughs> you, you don't want God to say, make it fair, God. He's like, uh, excuse me, are you sure? <laughs> because before I start dealing with that person, i got to deal with you. And by the way, the Bible says the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You don't even know your own heart. So before you start raining down condemnation on this person and raining down condemnation on me, you need to check you. In this story, it's about, it's actually a book called Habakkuk. Habakkuk was a prophet and he was watching all this injustice happen in his country. There was a revival going on, but at the same time, there was wickedness and idolatry and immorality and greed and he's watching his own people sin against God, sin against God. He's watching the law of God not be executed. The law being perverted, injustice reigning everywhere. And he's like, God, how come you don't judge this? And God gives him an answer he don't like. And then God says, you just need to trust me. My challenge to you is that some of y'all are going through something right now. 
and you have a situation in your life you don't like. Matter of fact, let's take a survey. How many of you have a situation in your life you just don't like it? Amen. Woo, yes. <laughs> this is for you. <laughs> I got a situation in my life, life I don't like. I've been, I got, well, many situations, but one particular that deals with someone very close to me that I've been asking God for for 10 years. 10 years, God, why? So I'm with you, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute. So in this story, Habakkuk's going to first tell God, God, I don't like this situation. Let's read chapter 1, verse 1, verse 2. Oh, Lord, how long shall I cry and you not hear? Even cry to you violence, and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity or sin and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is stripe and contention arises. Therefore, the law is powerless. Justice never goes forth. The wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, perverse judgment proceeds. He says, God, what is the deal? Why are you letting this bad stuff happen? And then God gives him an answer he don't like. Look what it says in verse 5. The Lord says, look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, though it were told you. For indeed I am raising up the Chaldeans or the Babylonians. By the way, they were evil like ISIS. I am raising up the Chaldeans or the Babylonians, a bitter and hasty nation, which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity proceed from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards and more fierce than even evening wolves. Their, char they charges, their charges charge ahead. Their cavalry comes from afar. They fly as an eagle that hastens to eat. Basically, he says, Habakkuk, you thought your people were bad? I'm raising up the Chaldeans who are even worse. And they're going to judge your people. He's like, what? I don't get that. And then look at verse, verse 12. He, he has a second question. He says, aren't you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die, O Lord. You have appointed them for judgment, O Rock. You have marked them for correction. You are, pure, you have, you are of purer eyes than to behold evil. You can't do that. You cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person more righteous than he? And God, I don't get it. Why are you doing that? And then look what he says in verse 1, uh, uh, verse one of chapter 2. He says, uh, uh, Habakkuk says, I will stand and watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me now. What I will answer when I am corrected. In other words, what's he going to say now? He says, God, hey, how can you, here is injustice happening and you're going to even use evil against the injustice. I don't get that. There are some times when God does stuff that you just don't understand. Look what it says in verse 2 of chapter 2. And here's the answer. The Lord answered me and said, write the vision. Make it plain on tablets. That he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end it will speak, it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it. Because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold, the proud, his soul is not, is not upright in him. But the just shall live by faith. My friends, in our, as humans, we always like to have every answer laid out for us. When I get saved, tell me when to read the Bible, tell me what I should read, how I should pray, how often should I go to church. Just give me all the rules so I can put it in a little box. And I can understand and make sure I do all the things. And, and let me tell you something. It's really good to have a system. It's really good to have, have guidelines for your life. But there's way more to it than that. Because God's not going to work within the little system that we all create. The ruling principle on earth is control. We like to have control of everything in our life. We like to have our answers, our systems. We want to know and be able to predict the future. In heaven, the ruling principle is peace. Where God has everything in control. And there are going to become times in your life, right, like right now, where all of y'all are dealing with stuff, that you're just going to have to trust God. You're not going to understand. 
It's easy to say, God, I'm going to worship you when everything's fine. It's easy to say, I'm going to love my, my friends and the people who treat me good. But what about when things don't go your way? What about when your life takes a right turn, when you wanted to take a left turn, when you see people who are getting blessed that you don't like or you think are not righteous or, ju or just or you think are unfair to you? And you're saying, God, what's up? And then you see them get blessed even more. And you, do, you, 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 you pray even more and you see them blessed even more and say, God, I don't understand. He says, just wait. Just trust me. Just trust me. Can you do that? No, God, I want answers. You got to be able to trust me without answers. You have to trust me just because of who I am. I can't give, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not required to give you answers. I am holy and just and right all the time. You just have to trust me. And if you can learn to trust God even when nothing makes sense, you're in a good place because that, mean, that means pain doesn't have any sting on your life anymore. Because what the devil says, oh, if you do that, bad's going to happen. And you run away from the bad. But when you can look bad in the eye. I, was, I did a chapel uh, 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 last night for the Cleveland Browns. And one of their players was a guy named Joe Hayden. And he's a defensive back. And I was talking about fighting. And how a lot of Christians don't fight for what they fight in prayer for what they believe the Bible says they should have. They don't fight to hold on to God in hard times. And I was like, Joe, you know, you're a cornerback, and when you line up and there's a receiver in front of you and the dude is good because they're all good, you don't sit there and go, oh, go ahead. You say, no, no, we're going to fight. You ain't catching the ball today. And if he catches one, you're going to tell him that's all you're going to get today. And if he catches two, that's all you're going to get today. And you don't give up ever, ever. Even when you get someone scores a touchdown, you still don't give up. He said, when stuff's not going your way, he said, Habakkuk, Habakkuk, I know that you don't understand why your people are evil. I know you don't understand how I'm going to use even a more evil people to judge your people. You just got to trust me. That's it. That's all I'm giving you. So trust me. Look what he says in chapter 2, verse 14. He says, Habakkuk, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. Oh, it's going down. It's going, it, it's going down. In the end, everybody's going, no, I don't need to have everyone bowing down to me right now. They will bow down. Look at verse 20. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. I will judge the wicked and I will reward and honor the righteous. But as for you, you just need to trust me. Look in your notes. You need to fight to hold on to God when you don't think he is fair. This is so pitiful because what happens is when you don't think God's fair, this little voice comes into your head and says, why are you even going to church? Look at that. Why are you even praying? God don't answer your prayer. Look at that. Why are you, why are you even giving money? Look at that. Why are you even trying to be nice? Look at that. And you go, yeah, 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 yeah. That's exactly what the devil wants you to say. Instead of saying, no, 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 no. My God, I don't understand, but I'm still holding on. I don't get it, but I'm still holding on. That's it. That, that, that is a decision of your heart. It has nothing to do with what you feel. I have a little baby girl. That does not walk with God. For 10 years, I've been crying out to God, God, you don't owe me anything. However, <laughs> I am kind of, you know, passing the rock church, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> can, can you help a brother out? I mean, I'm trying to preach the gospel every day, and, you know, I'm reading my Bible, I'm praying, you know what I'm saying? And I see all these people getting saved. Can I just have one? Listen, Lord, how about if I give you these 10,000 souls back just for this one? One. My daughter, while I was screaming out to God, crying, God, why? Why? He says, you going to trust me? Come on, God. No, no, no. Are you going to trust me? I'm not going to explain it to you. I want you to trust me by faith. 
that's how you got to be. Does my daughter walk with God? Nope. Nope. Still to this day. He says, you hold on to me anyway. But God, you know, I just saw these, I just saw 15 at 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 an event, 29-year-old girls like my daughter. Their daughters are somebody else. Why can't, you going to trust me? What's your issue? You got to say, God, you know what? I don't understand because your ways are not my ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so your thoughts and ways are above mine. But I'm going to trust you. I'm not only going to trust you when things go my way. I'm going to trust you when things don't go my way. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were getting ready to get thrown in the fire because all they, they wouldn't do this. They wouldn't bow to an idol. They wouldn't do this to save their life because they wanted to honor God. And they're like, God, all these pagan people, and you're telling me you're going to let us die just because we won't do this? And God's like, just watch it and see what they're going to do. And if it was, if it was me, I might be like, we <laughs> dropping something on the ground. Oh, yeah, my bad, my bad. The fire looks hot. <laughs> and they said, they said, nope. God, we're going to trust you even now. They got thrown in the fire. The angel of the Lord, Jesus, came in the fire with them, saved them. They came out of the fire. They were in the fire. One of my favorite stories in the Bible. I got like a hundred favorite stories in the Bible. They were in the fire and Nebuchadnezzar said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High. That's what he called them, servants of the Most High. What do people call you? Service of the Most High, come out, come out. If, if I was them, I'd be in the fire, right? I'm walking around, their hair was blowing in the fire flames, and, 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 and their lawyers down there, they're walking around. The Bible said they weren't hurt, the smell of smoke wasn't on them, they weren't, their, their hair wasn't singed, and, and, and you know, fire singed your hair like that. And they're in the fire, they're in the fire, and nothing's happening. And he says, Nebuchadnezzar said, come on out, come on out. If I was them, I would have been like, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, you're the king, won't you come on in? It's nice and warm in here, homie. Let's go. Come on, get a tan. You look kind of fail up there. Come on, get a tan. Come on down here with us. Uh, you know, people who walk with God go places other people can't go. You got to trust God when things are not going your way. That is the proof of your faith. Because the Bible says if, you're, if you faint in the day of adversity, your faith is weak. For your faith to be strong when things are going good, you don't need it. What kind of faith do you need? I'm doing good. It's when things go bad that you say, no, I'm going to hold on to God. Look at number two in your notes. You need to fight to hold on to God when you think God is wrong. (laughs) When you think God is wrong, you need to shut your mouth. (laughs) God, you're wrong. Excuse me? My son, I I think it was my son, he, he, a long time ago, he, I remember he said something he shouldn't have said to me and and all my wife. And we said, okay, look, we don't, we understand you don't disagree. Let's rewind the tape. And try your approach again. You can tell God you don't agree, but you always want to do it from a place of respect and honor to God. Not that my son honored me like God, but respect. But to God, God, I don't understand this. And respectfully, I think it's wrong. Can you enlighten me? Because I know that you're always right. Matter of fact, the last thing in your notes is to fight on, fight to hold on to God because you know in the end he is always right. He loves you. He's always gotten you through. You need to say, Lord, here we go again. I, pain is just part of our fallen world. We're surrounded by sinners. We are a sinner. Stuff is jacked up all around us. Okay, God, I'm holding on to you because there's nowhere else I can go. And when the storm is going back and forth in my life, where am I going to go? Where are you going to Where? where am I, my, wife, my voice is going to like Michael Jackson. Where are you going to go? <laughs> Look at the last verse of the whole book, chapter 3, verse 19. <clears throat> it says, the Lord God is my strength or my scrumph. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like a deer's feet. He will make me walk on high hills. What's a deer's feet? You ever see a deer fall down? No. Now, for real, you ever see a deer fall down? How many of you have ever seen a deer 
it probably, it, whether it's TV or for real, but if for real, it's even more incredible. Just run up a hill. Anybody? How many of y'all never seen that? That's messed up. That's like, that's like amazing. You ever see, you ever see, you ever see one of those, those goats on a cliff? And the cliff is like this for like a mile straight down. And they're just like there with their babies. Anybody seen that on TV? It's awesome. Their feet is like, I don't know what they have on their feet, but their balance is like crazy ridiculous. They got skills. Animals got some skills. And then they can jump, you know, like their verticals like 90 feet high. And they, and they just land just like that. He says, he says, God, give me feet so when my whole world gets rocked, I'm like, I'm good. When everything gets turned upside down, my, I'm on a rock. By the way, what's the name of this church? It's called the what church? It don't move. Jesus is the rock of your salvation. Here's my challenge to you. Is that when you think about your life right now, you think about what's going on in your life. You think about the stuff that you don't like. That you say, God... I trust you anyway. In a minute, we're going to take communion. But before you take communion, you need to ask and make sure that Jesus is your Savior. Why? Because when you take communion, what you are telling God is, God, I acknowledge that you died for me. And I acknowledge that I know you rose from the dead and that you gave your life and shed your blood for me. What you don't want to do is say, Lord, I acknowledge that, but yet I reject you. You want to make sure that you've asked Christ to be your Savior. So before we take communion, we're going to ask you to pray to ask Jesus to be your Savior. And then after that, we'll take communion. And then after that, we're going to do an altar call for prayer. Especially for all of y'all who are struggling right now with something. That God says, I know what you're going through. I know what happened last night. I know the pain from your childhood. I know what your spouse did. Your father did. Your boyfriend did. Girlfriend did. I know. I know what your uncle or that stranger did. Did I know? I can get you through. But first, we're going to ask Jesus to be our Savior. If God spoke to you during that sermon and you feel like you want to ask Christ to be your Savior, it's as simple as A, B, C. One, admit and accept that you are a sinner. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and He died for your sin and rose from the dead. And then confess yourself as a sinner and say, Jesus, please forgive me of my sin. So if you would like to ask Jesus Christ to be your Savior, I just want you to just look at me right now and pray this prayer with me in the privacy of your heart, knowing that God knows you and loves you very much. Say, dear God, I believe that I'm a sinner. I know the penalty of my sin is death. And I don't want to die and go to hell. But I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he died and rose from the dead for my sin. And I confess myself a sinner and ask him to forgive me of my sin. Jesus, please forgive me of my sin and fill me with the Spirit of God. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, you just ask Christ to be your Savior. We want to know and we want to email you some resources. So if you just prayed that prayer with me to accept Jesus as your Savior, click on the link that just appeared and we want to send you some free resources. God bless you and we'll see you in heaven.